everybody, this is Pastor Phil, and we are so glad that you chose to worship with us like this today. We believe the church is powerful when it gathers and when it scatters, so we hope that this is a wonderful experience for you, and we invite you to open God's Word with us today.
Well, good morning, Living Hope Church. We're glad you guys could be with us today. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse 29 here in just a minute. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, um, we recognize again today our need of you in so many ways. God, I need you. We need you. And Father, I pray your grace in your presence upon the hearts and minds and lives of your children today, your people. Bring comfort, bring wisdom. Father, bring the presence of your spirit. And may this morning be a part of what you want to do in our lives today. God, as we read your word and talk about it, bless it, multiply it, honor it inside of our hearts and minds and lives this morning. We're thankful for this time. We pray all these things in your magnificent name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 is where we're going to start reading here in just a second. Now, one of the oldest pieces of advice that has ever been given to young people has been to find someone you want to grow up to be like and imitate their fashion of life. And when I say that that's one of the oldest pieces of advice, I mean that piece of advice goes about as far back as we actually have human writing. We go as far back as the book of Proverbs, and a lot of Proverbs is all about imitation. Listen to wise people, watch the lives of wise people, and follow their lives. Even the ancient Greek philosophers of just about every stripe, they taught that the way to learn a life of virtue is to find virtuous people and then imitate their way of life. Guys, imitation is a critical part of our maturity. It happens naturally, and it needs to happen proactively. So we as Christians need to be deliberate about who we imitate, what form of life we're watching, and then patterning patterning ourselves after. You see, if we do not pay attention to how we imitate, who we imitate, um, our characters in our lives will be formed without us even knowing it. Um, Because this is just what happens inside of the human heart. Now, there are plenty of wise and good people for us to pay attention to and to imitate. But as Christians, we are called to make sure that Christ is right at the very top of that list. That it is his character that we are following after. We're learning about and that we are imitating. So guys, this is absolutely critical for us as Christians. We need to learn to imitate the character and the nature of God. We need to learn what God is really like, and that often involves fixing our misperceptions of who God is. Learn who he really is, and then just follow in that way of life. The passage of scripture that we're going to read today is actually rounding out this section about this new life. It begins especially in chapter 4, verse 17, where Paul essentially says, I implore you, please don't walk in that old way of life anymore. You've learned something new in Christ, and I need you to walk in this day, uh, in this way of life. We continue now this pattern of Paul saying, don't walk like this, do walk like this, and here is why. And we discover the, the big reason why in this passage, and that is that you and I need to be imitators of God. There are three big concepts that Paul is going to hit on very quickly that's going to control how we look at this passage of Scripture. And these concepts are grace and forgiveness and love. So the first thought in this passage is that we give grace, especially in our speech with one another. So instead of destructive conversation, Paul says we can give gifts to people in the way that we talk to them. The way that we speak to them and relate to them, we give grace instead of destruction. So we give grace, and then we forgive, and we forgive in a really interesting way. See, our example, when it comes to forgiveness, is a really incredible standard. Paul says here that we need to learn to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. So we give grace, and we forgive, and the third thought is we walk in love. And then the example that Paul gives about walking in love is 
is the ultimate act of sacrifice for the good of another. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ so that you and I can be in relationship with him both now and forever. So we're learning what it is to imitate God, to learn his character, and to walk in his ways. So let's hear how Paul puts this. In chapter 4, verse 29, the text goes like this. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. It's a phenomenal passage of Scripture, a beautiful description of what life with Christ should be and, and can be if we learn what it is to walk this way of life. Paul begins by saying, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth. Some of your older translations may even say, don't let any filthy talk come out of your mouths. The word that Paul uses there is provocative. It doesn't just mean coarse language. It's a word that you would use to describe rotting fish. So it is, it's just, it's, it's rotten talk. It's destructive talk. This is the kind of speech that, that tears other people down. It's a certain form of cruelty that we impose on other people. It causes pain and division in relationship and in the hearts and minds of other people. And Paul says, don't let that kind of talk come out of you. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. Scripture is clear in so many ways about the power of our speech with other people. Jesus says things like that uh, the abundance of our heart turns into what we speak, right? What comes out of our mouth comes out of the abundance of our hearts. What's going on inside of our character is what's going to come out of our mouths. And so it's a signal to us for what's going on inside of here. James says the tongue is this really small part of the body, but it may as well be the rudder of a giant ship because it can turn the whole thing one way or the other. We go back to the book of Proverbs, and the book of Proverbs is actually pretty clear over and over again that the way we tell the difference between the fool and the wise person is the way that they talk. One particular passage of Scripture is Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, and he says this, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. There are certain people who talk in such a way, they may as well just be slicing you up, right? Now, the way we use our tongues, it's like the thrust of a sword into our life. But the tongue of the wise person can actually be a balm, can actually bring healing. And as Paul puts it in this passage, it's like bringing grace into someone's life. So our words can be powerful things in the lives of other people, both to tear down and to build up. So that's what Paul does. Don't let this kind of speech come out of you anymore, but instead of that, here's what you do. You speak in a way that's good for building up. It's good for edifying. It's good for encouraging people. And you do it as the need arises, or as this translation says, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So instead of all of that destructive talk, we, we need to learn how to talk so that we build other people up. Paul says we can actually fill a certain kind of need in someone's life by the way that we speak if we do it with God's kind of grace. It's really, it's really a very powerful thought. And if you've experienced this, you know what, is, what it is like when someone speaks the right kind of grace or wisdom or kindness into your life instead of those things that are destructive or hurtful. We know the difference. Paul says, learn to, to be that kind of difference in people's lives. So this is encouraging speech. It's helpful. It's kind. It's thoughtful. It's wise instead of all of these other things. And the way Paul formulates this, sometimes in our translations, in the English, um, it feels a little broken up. We don't know exactly what it means. When he says, you speak in a way that, 
that is good for building up and as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. What it seems to be that Paul is saying is that we can speak in a way that brings God's grace into someone's life so that they can be who God made them to be. It actually is an open door for God's grace into someone's life. This is wise speech. This is speech that is prompted by the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts instead of the speech that comes out of our brokenness and sin and pain and malice and frustration, all these words that Paul uses in this passage. So we actually become a part of what God does in people's lives if we learn how to speak with God's kinds of grace. As I thought about that this, uh, this, this past week, um, I began to think a lot about what social media is like right now and how social media works. We spend a lot of time communicating with each other over social media, especially in a time of quarantine when other normal modes of communication are kind of turned down or just taken away from us. We go to our phones, we go to our social media. And guys, it turns out the way that social media is built, it encourages all of the wrong kinds of what we would call tribal behavior. So it's very easy on social media to find people who are like us, who agree with us, who would say yes to everything that we say. We gather them around us, and as a tribe, we begin to hurl stones at absolutely everybody else. Conversation on social media degrades very quickly to the lowest common denominator. We know what this is like because we watch it happen and sometimes we actually engage in this behavior ourselves. We sling insults at people. We shame them. This whole matter of what we call cancel culture comes out of how we use social media to marginalize people, to bully people. Uh, to mock them instead of engage with them. And it's, it's built to do these kinds of destructive, corruptive things in our conversation with other people. A wonderful book called The Time to Build by Yuval, Yuval Levin, he writes this about social media platforms and how they work. And tell me if this doesn't sound familiar to you. He says this, they drive us to speak without listening, to approach others confrontationally rather than graciously, to speak conspiracies and rumors, to dismiss and ignore what we would rather not hear, to make the private public, to oversimplify a complex world, to react to one another much too quickly and curtly. It's a wonderful way of explaining what we watch happen on social media. We read something like that and we can think, yeah, I know that person. Yeah, I was friends with that person until I blocked them. The question that's being posed to you and me, though, is how much of that is me? How much of that is the way that I speak with people, either in person or over social media? And the question becomes, do I imitate that behavior? I see it a lot. Do I imitate it? I give as well as I get, right? Am I gonna imitate that behavior or is there something else that is possible because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? Now, the reason why here is, is really cool. Paul says, don't let that kind of speech. Instead, speak this way graciously to other people. And here's the why. It's in verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. This is a really cool thought in this context. That kind of corrupting speech actually brings grief and sadness to the Holy Spirit. And this is the Holy Spirit who has sealed us for our life with Jesus Christ both now and forever. This is fascinating to me. This behavior grieves the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God's presence with us keeping us for the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit is guiding us into the kingdom of God. It is the third member of the Trinity actually living in our lives, empowering us, trying to give birth to fruit, what scripture calls the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, so that we can walk the way of Christ instead of the way of the world. So the Holy Spirit is keeping us for the kingdom of God, shaping us, in the kingdom of God. And so when we behave in a different way, it actually grieves the Holy Spirit within us. It's beautiful. 
God's given us this thing, the Spirit of God, this person, to shape us in His image. And when we walk the other way, it actually brings sorrow to the Holy Spirit inside of our lives. The work of the Holy Spirit is instead of corrupting talk, it is the act of learning how to give grace to other people where it is so desperately needed so that God can be at work inside of their lives. That's the work of the Holy Spirit inside of our lives. Paul goes on to say this in verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Just get rid of this stuff. And so instead of that, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let all bitterness and wrath and clamor and slander and malice, just let all of that be gone. These are these combinations of things that, that grow inside of our hearts and grow inside of our minds. Bitterness, Scripture calls us, it's a certain kind of root that, that sinks itself into our soul. And if it goes too deep, it's hard to get out. So the things that happen inside of us that turn into the way that we talk to other people, turns into the way that we think about other people and behave toward other people. So it has this unique destructive quality when it sits in our hearts and stays there. It, it doesn't just stay in our hearts. It actually turns to the way that we treat other people. So our anger, our malice, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. It is this desire for harm in the lives of others. And this may be common in a lot of circles. This may be common in the way that we used to lead our lives before Christ. And this is what Paul has told them. You've learned something else now. It may have even been common in the way that, that we behaved. But in God's kingdom, God is busy building people up instead of tearing people down. God is, God is reassembling people. God is assembling the body of Christ. He's turning us into these kinds of things that can be filled with his presence and power and overflowing with that so that other people see who God is. That's what God is building in our lives. So when we act in a way that's contrary to that in the lives of other people, it brings grief to the Holy Spirit. It is contrary to the work of God inside of our lives because in God's kingdom, he's building up instead of breaking people down. So again, instead of all of those other things that he lists, he says in verse 32, be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, and fundamentally, he says, be forgiving of one another as Christ, or excuse me, as God in Christ forgave you. This sounds a lot like the list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And here Paul says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. So instead of cruelty, these kinds of things are at work inside of the lives of the followers of Jesus Christ. And specifically, instead of malice toward other people, it's kindness, being tender-hearted, and then we forgive, he says. There is forgiveness, and he says, we forgive because God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ. So here's that pattern again. Don't do that. Do this instead, and here's why. Because God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ. But what's so powerful about this moment is that it's not just here's why because we have for, been forgiven. It's here's how we forgive each other. Forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. And that, guys, is a powerful standard. That is a life-changing standard. When we get a hold of what that means, and then we learn how to actually live that out. Earlier on in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul gives us a glimpse into exactly what it means to talk about how God has forgiven us. 
So in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, he says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. That's beautiful. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God, because of his love and his mercy and his power, he reached out, he forgave, and he saved me. It doesn't say the moment I decided that I needed to turn to God because he was the right thing to do, that's when God reveals his love to me. It's while I was still dead in my trespasses and sins. This is how I receive the forgiveness of God. Guys, something powerful happens within us when we allow bitterness and malice and anger to sit in our hearts. It becomes a justification, a constant justification for unforgiveness. We know we have a legitimate reason for for why we should hang on to that bitterness or unforgiveness. You don't know what they did to me, right? We tell ourselves those kinds of story stories to justify unforgiveness. But when we look at Christ, when we look at what's been done to us, for us, through Jesus Christ, you see the work of Christ on the cross overlooks all that I have done in my sin so that I can be reconciled to God. As I have been forgiven, I need to learn how to forgive. This is, again, life-changing stuff. So guys, this is, this is important when we talk about this lifestyle and, and how it begins to change us and how we behave. Something else happens as well. As we live this way, the, the Christian is showing their neighbor who God is by giving what we have received how we have received it. We actually reveal to our neighbor what God is like if we can give the kind of grace and forgiveness that we have received from him. So we were given grace, so we learn to give it. I just find this critical for the life of the Christian. We should learn how to give the kind of grace that we have been forgiven. Or are we demeaning the grace that God has given us if we refuse to give it to other people, right? We, we have received undeserved forgiveness. So we're learning how to give that to other people. The world around us, the sin within us, stokes the other way of life. But we know that that other way of life is just a perpetual path of brokenness, right? But the way of Jesus Christ, shown to us by the Holy Spirit and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it leads us down a completely different path. And so we're learning with grace and forgiveness to imitate God. Instead of to imitate, instead of imitating the ways of this world. So we find ourselves in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And these two verses go like this. Therefore, this this is kind of the exclamation mark at the end of this particular section. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. You are his beloved children, so imitate him. And walk in love as Christ loved us. And gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Therefore, be imitators of God. So here it is explicit. Take your eyes off of those corrupt examples. Learn how to take your priorities off of the sin that's at work inside of you. And turn those things on to Jesus Christ. Your your attention, your eyes, your priorities, your habits, your behaviors... Turn them to Christ and learn what that looks like. Become imitators of God. Now, one of the ways this happens is when we read Scripture and we spend time with God in prayer and so on and so forth, but we can also watch those in our lives who have learned these things. They're a few steps further down the road than we are, and they've, they've learned things about life with Christ that we're still learning or we're just kind of stumbling 
are stumbling over ourselves with, but these others have learned these things, and we can learn to imitate them um, as their lives reflect Christ. In fact, this is almost exactly what Paul says in a couple of places. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, it's as clear as it could possibly be. Paul says this, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ, Paul says. I had a professor in college, a religious studies professor, who took this verse of scripture to argue that Paul was one of the most arrogant men in history. That he was telling people all over the Mediterranean world to just imitate him and follow his way of life. I think that gets that verse of scripture completely upside down because what Paul is saying is actually a profound act of humility. The only reason you should pay attention to me is if you see Christ in me. Be imitators of me as I follow Jesus Christ. It's, it's another way of saying, don't follow me. Don't pay attention to me. Don't listen to me if you don't see Christ in me. So it's legitimate to find those people in our lives, but our standard, even as Paul says, our standard is always Christ the character and nature of who he is. And when we see that around us in others, we learn how to live that life because we're seeing Christ in those lives. Guys, I'm kind of, I'm kind of beating this drum for a couple of weeks. I'm going to beat it again for us this morning. Our culture desperately needs people to lead the way out of the way things are right now. Our culture needs these kinds of leaders. Our culture needs these kinds of people who are not just different, quirky, but who are different because they look like Jesus and they talk like Jesus and they act like Jesus and they think like Jesus. We can keep on trying the same things over and over again, cancel culture and shaming people and tribal behavior. We can keep on trying that or we can just learn to walk a different path altogether, as Paul says, right? Guys, the divisions in our culture just keep getting deeper and they keep getting wider. There, there was this hope at the beginning of the pandemic that this old aphorism would be true, that there's a common enemy and it pulls us together and we unify with each other, um, you know, behind a common enemy or a common cause. And maybe that happened for a little while, but it didn't take very long for the breaks in our culture that were there before all of this happened to not just show back up again, but to get wider and deeper and more significant. Guys, I believe that this might actually be a once in a century opportunity for the church to step in and be something not just different, but powerfully different, culture changing different, life changing different for people to see something else if the church learns how to follow the way of Jesus Christ. In the last mark, and as we think about what that looks like, the, the last mark that Paul mentions here about what it means to imitate Christ is that we walk in the love that we see in Jesus Christ. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is a certain kind of love that is beautiful to God. Paul says it's, it's a fragrant offering. Um, it's pleasing to him. It's good. This kind of love is, is good to him. And it's critical that we understand that as imitators of Christ's kind of love because of a, a lot of what passes for love in our culture right now takes no account of the truth and really takes no account of what is best for other people's well-being. It is by and large just a matter of behavior acceptance. That's largely what love means in our broader culture right now. We see something different when we pay attention to Christ. We become imitators of God. What we see is a sacrificial love. What is love? Biblical. That's a huge topic, but guys, love is a matter of attachment. What we're willing to attach our lives to, our priorities to, our finances to, our emotions to. It's a matter of commitment. It's a matter of sacrifice. And it, our emotions are part of that. But love is not just emotion. It's all these other things that we express as we have watched 
God expressed that love to us through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Think about it, guys. You are willing to sacrifice for things or people that are valuable to you. On every level of value, from it is a little valuable to me to valuable as anything else, right? You are willing to put everything on the line for the things that you love or value the most. And so it is that Christ died for our sins. And so it is that the Christian learns what love is and learns how to express that love in a Christ-like fashion. And guys, to me, this is where we begin to find hope in every season of life, but especially in a season of life like this. Hope is a matter of of fervently anticipating that something good will happen in the future. This is not wild-eyed optimism. This is not pie-in-the-sky empty hope. This is the kingdom of God at work amongst us so that these kinds of goods can bring grace into the lives of people, can bring the kind of healing that forgiveness gives, that can actually change lives the way that love changes lives. This is genuine hope inside of the body of Christ, the family of God. This is genuine hope expressed to the rest of the world. But in our brokenness and our sin, we don't do these things naturally. So we need a leader. And this is why we speak of imitating God, of imitating Christ in all things. Guys, the character of God is the standard for the followers of Jesus Christ. The character of God in the end is the standard for followers of Jesus Christ. The answer for how to live life is for Christ to get bigger and bigger in our vision of life, for him to become greater and all-consuming in our vision of what life is and what life can be like. So do we struggle with how to give grace when everything within us wants to tear people down? Well, then we need to get to know Scripture, and we need to get to know the words and the relationships that Jesus Christ gives us inside of Scripture Do we think that we are justified in our unforgiveness? Then we need to get to know the darkness of my sin and come to terms with the expansiveness of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Do we withhold love or do we give it without any consideration of the truth? Then we need to get to know the cross of Jesus Christ. To put our eyes upon it, our hearts, our lives, our attention upon it, and pay attention to it until we are changed by the love of Jesus Christ. And in this, friends, we find a new way of life. And in this, guys, the world begins to see who God really is. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this time. And God, I ask that the words that we have read in scripture and dealt with would sink into um, our thoughts and our emotions and our desires and our behaviors and and would become who we are um, naturally and easily as the Holy Spirit is at work building the kingdom of God within us. And may the world see Jesus Christ. May our neighbors see Jesus Christ because of what you do inside of us even this week. We pray this, Father, in your magnificent name. Amen.
Well, we're so glad that you were able to join us today. And we want to make sure that you know that we are collecting a group of resources that are intended to help you with worship and discipleship in your home. If you go to the front page of our website, lhcco.org, you'll begin to find many of those links. And especially right at the very top, you're going to find the link Worship at Home. And if you follow that link, you're going to find a growing group of resources that will help uh, families with kids or individuals with faith skills. Um, just tools to help you begin to engage with your walk with Jesus Christ, hopefully in a brand new and powerful way. So we encourage you to take advantage of those, and we look forward to seeing you again next time.